Nice. And we're on the home stretch here, folks. How is everybody? Hopefully you had a good break. Yes? Woo! I heard one woo! <laughs> woo! <laughs> there were fresh berries, right? It's almost that time of year. So I'm with Kaiser. I work with Brad Anderson, who spoke earlier. We are at the Interstate Campus. So we have medical providers there. We're an outpatient clinic. I'm the supervisor there. We have a, a clinical team that I supervise. And as you can tell by Brad's talk, we take ourselves very seriously on that hallway. Um, so I'm here to talk about a behavioral approach to trauma resolution. I need to begin by saying that the presentations up to this point have been fantastic, have they not? I mean, come on, give it up. <clears throat> that being said, you're gonna see a lot of overlap. I mean, really a lot of my work has been done for me by my fellow presenters. Um, I joked with Rachel that I was just going to get up here and work on my rap career in front of you all. But I, I, will, I will move forward. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm sharing, well let me talk about my objective. So I want to just help put a different frame around some of what you've been hearing today, a behavioral perspective on trauma. Okay, so, so I work in addiction medicine. Uh, there's a lot I could say about both areas. I'm going to focus on trauma, okay? A particular approach to PTSD that I'm trained in, I'm going to share a little bit of detail about that to give you that snapshot. I want to hopefully expand your understanding of the therapeutic relationship and how that can help with trauma resolution. That's not just my therapeutic relationship, that's your therapeutic relationship, okay? And point you towards some resources on how you can expand your own understanding. Okay, I'm sharing the hour, 70 minutes with Nora Stern, physical therapist, fabulous. We're splitting our time. These are the objectives that she has, talking about phrasing for pain care, identifying the role of pain education, and then how to make appropriate referrals to rehab services. Okay, that being said, in addition to our own respective bodies of knowledge we're going to share, we're, we're going to have a case discussion each with our own symptoms that we're dealing with. This equates to 20 pounds of rocks in a five pound bag, okay? So this is, this is what we're gonna try to accomplish today. A brief snapshot of the case, we're gonna be uh, briefly discussing a 38 year old Caucasian female, married, no children, extensive abuse history, sexual and physical, we're talking torture, incest, multiple foster homes. This person is clean and sober now, over a year in recovery, active in Alcoholics Anonymous, some of the symptoms that are arising for this person, they can't handle being in crowds, can't handle anybody being behind them. There's a very exaggerated startle response with this individual. There is high sympathetic and parasympathetic arousal going on. So imagine if your system had the gas and the brake on, right? So a lot of sympathetic arousal, but, the, but the, there's a lot of bracing happening, okay? They're emotionally labile, and they actually experience some physical sensations. Tightening in the chest, this patient described to me, it feels like I'm being hit, and then the sensation goes away, okay? Is it, is it not loud enough? How about now? Is that better? <laughs> I mean, I, I speak pretty loudly. Um, I guess I'll be speaking loudly then. <laughs> well, that's okay. Thank you for being here. So um, rather than put the diagnostic criteria up there for, for PTSD out of the DSM-5, I wanted to give you some different descriptions of trauma. Lydia mentioned uh, Bessel van der Kolk, and I, I chose a quote from him as well. Traumatized people chronically feel unsafe inside their bodies. The past is alive in the form of gnawing interior discomfort. Their bodies are constantly bombarded by visceral warning signs. And in an attempt to control these processes, they often become expert at ignoring their gut feelings and in numbing awareness of what is played out inside. So this, all this discussion about addiction, right there, numbing awareness. So we, we know that people with addiction a large percentage also have trauma histories, okay? They learn to hide from themselves, okay? So again, Lydia's discussion about the brain and some of the negative effects on the brain, I, I just heard myself get louder, yes? Okay. Um, 
it, we're, we're seeing how things can come, become very compartmentalized, which, which affects how we interact with these patients, okay? This is Tim Robbins from the Shawshank Redemption. I loved this. Bad luck, I guess. It floats around. It's got to land on somebody. It was my turn. That's all. I was in the path of the tornado. I just didn't expect the storm would last as long as it has, okay? And for some people, it's been their whole lives. Another example of trauma visually that you can see, this is a photographer named Claire Felici who shot um, the 13th Infantry of the Royal Netherlands Marine Corps. This is before, during, and after deployment to war, okay? These are, uh, pr I agree, haunting triptychs. You look at the first picture, we see, you know, a pretty normal affect. I like to draw attention to the fact that the eyes are alive, right? There's almost a twinkle in those eyes. And there's a um, coherence to the, to the facial muscles. And then you can start to see this transformation, the eyes getting wider, very fear-based middle picture there. And then we have the third picture. We're looking at trauma there. Okay, the flat affect. To me, that looks like almost like a stone mask, right? The eyes have lost that brightness, that light, okay? Now, you can imagine it with providers when we're, we have our patient loads coming at us. You know, who, who do we maybe have more resistance and apprehension about dealing with, right? Here's another example from that same uh, photographer. And it's, it's almost heartbreaking for me to see these. Um, the, the smile, the, the hope, the innocence, and then clearly that, that fear, that, that sympathetic arousal and, and, and immobilization that is now present. Third example. And it's all in the image, right? So with those images in mind, let's talk about what a healthy nervous system looks like. I would imagine that most of you exemplify this, right? I'd like to think I do, I'm not sure. Ask those in my life. The person will be relaxed and at ease. The body and its senses will be relaxed yet alert, responsive, okay? They are present through all layers of self, physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual. Physiology is appropriately responsive to a variety of circumstances. Responses are fluid and resilient. And I'll give you an example of that, that fluidity that maybe we take for granted. You know, working with a patient with that high startle response, any sound behind her in the hallway of my office, I'm, I'm gonna try not to feed this back, and it's this, every little sound. Whereas a fluid, resilient system might look more like this. Oh, well, what was that? So those types of, of kinesthetics you can pay attention to, okay? There I am again. Experience of having choices and options and the capacity for healthy relationships. So a healthy nervous system. I'm gonna call that coherence, right? Things are coherent. Here's a, a, a graphical representation of this, which I need to give credit to the uh, uh, Somatic Experiencing Trauma Institute, the work of Peter Levine, which I'm gonna say more about. But the healthy nervous system, we've got this normal range and we can see arousal and activation, uh, an uh, a pendulation between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic response. So you, ha you, you have a tense interaction with somebody and voices are raised. For example, when I'm on the phone with Comcast about <laughs> billing, <laughs> without a doubt, there I am again, sympathetic arousal goes up, okay? And then I decide, uh, that maybe I didn't handle that as well and I need to go for a walk around the block. And my parasympathetic system begins to respond. Parasympathetic, resting and digesting, okay? These are all parts of our system here. So, you know, I realized I'm gonna jump ahead for a quick second because I wanna show you this slide next. So this is that same graphic but um, showing a traumatic event and shock that has come into the system, okay? So we've got that normal range, we've got that natural sympathetic, parasympathetic pendulation happening that occurs in our daily lives, right? It's all, it's all very wired for us. We didn't have to dream this stuff up, this kept us going for eons, right? But when we have that traumatic event come in, you can see how the 
the nervous system response be can become much more erratic. This is what trauma looks like within the system, okay? And when we really get people who are over threshold, we're looking at s the sympathetic arousal being stuck on on or maybe stuck on off. That stuck on off is immobility. These lists I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow up for you here now. Isn't that interesting? I find that fascinating. So if people are really in that symptoms of what we're going to call undischarged traumatic stress, it's bound up, it's unresolved, we're looking at anxiety, panic, hypersensitivity, exaggerated startle response, inability to relax, restlessness, et cetera. Chronic pain is worth mentioning in there, okay? That, that parasympathetic or that freeze response, that's the freeze of fight, flight, or freeze, is immobility. It may, you may see depression, flat affects, lethargy, deadness, disconnection, dissociation, pain, low blood pressure, poor digestion, okay? I'm going to go back here now because I, now that we've sort of framed this nervous system and what it can look like, I want to bring some attention to a specific modality, and this is um, somatic experiencing. How many people have heard of somatic experiencing or somatic approaches to trauma? A lot of hands. That's, that's encouraging. That's great. Lydia touched on this, how, how as the trauma field is moving forward, this idea that the body really needs to be taken into consideration, this mind-body connection is so important, okay? So Peter Levine uh, really began to look, and, and a lot of his ideas stemmed from observing animal survival systems. And if you look at survival systems in humans and animals, they're virtually identical, but the difference is that animals don't have PTSD, okay? We do, and this is for a variety of reasons. Again, Lydia touched on this with, with the brain observations. We also have these things called egos, right? We have this consciousness, so we can have judgments, and this uh, belief that one is immoral or a bad person. I can assure you that the possum, after they play dead, and then gets up and shakes it off, isn't thinking, oh, I'm a bad possum. I'm a bad possum, I didn't deal with that well, right? <laughs> We get gummed up in that, and, 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 and if, if people have been exposed to extensive uh, trauma and those belief systems are in place or there's a lack of support, you're going to see where this energy, I'm going to call it energy, right? The mobilization energy that's required in these responses is massive, right? So the baseball is coming at you. You don't think, the baseball is coming, I'm going to move, like you move and then you process it cognitively, right? And there's a lot of energy that, gets, that, that is mobilized to get you out of that path, right? So animals have this amazing ability to spontaneously discharge these energies, right? They may shake it off, but, and then they just sort of go about their day. The fish that's swimming sees a big barracuda fish, and it stops. Barracuda passes, and the fish just kind of keeps on going, right? So prey animals are rarely traumatized. So then Peter goes on to say, trauma happens when the organism is strained beyond its adaptational capacity to regulate states of arousal, dysregulation, okay? So moving forward in this approach, for example, somatic experiencing facilitates the completion of these self-protective motor responses, which means we gotta work with the body. We gotta work with sensation. There was a great question earlier about mindfulness and maybe meditation around people who have trauma. And it's really good to be cautious. I've worked with patients who have years of meditation experience who take a break from meditation because they're finally working with their trauma. Because introducing sensation around traumatic events really needs to be titrated. Okay, so that's, that's a theme that's run through this day, whether it be medications or how we work with people. And that is so important. So there's a real mindfulness component to this. There's a tracking component, and it's getting people to just start to experience what a sensation feels like in the body, okay? This approach and many somatic approaches are not driven by content. By content, what I mean is uh, you sit down with a therapist, and the therapist says, okay, tell me everything. Tell me the whole gory story, right? More often than not, my bias is that people are triggered and re-traumatized by this, okay? It's falling away, this approach. And a lot of therapists think this is how you, this is how you work with trauma. You know, we're just going to have you tell the story over and over again. And I've worked with many patients in addiction medicine who say, as soon as I got out of those sessions, I wanted to go shoot up. I wanted to go drink. Okay? So 
we're not just focusing on content. We're, we're focusing on the whole body, the whole experience. And it needs to be slow and supported, OK? I could spend a whole day talking about this, so I'm giving you a really quick snapshot. Um, so these different systems shifting into how some of this can apply to you and, and your work, we're looking at, we've heard a lot about fight and flight and freeze. And then we really need to talk about social engagement, which is part of the parasympathetic nervous system, OK? It's calming, usually. So you fall overboard, you call for help. Help, help. That's social engagement. The child that looks to the parent for comfort, OK? Now, Stephen Porges, anybody heard of Porges? I think he might have been mentioned earlier. This idea of a polyvagal theory really separates these out, these different compartments of our nervous system, OK? And, and social engagement is its own branch in that groove, OK? So um, moving ahead here, well, before I move ahead, let's just admire this for a moment. If there's a theme from the day, it's that Star Trek is very important and Gary Larson is very important. <laughs> okay, so how nature says do not touch. <laughs> we have the rattlesnake, the puffer fish, the cat, and the gentleman standing with a swimming tube, a rifle, and a boot on his head. Um, it's behind me, isn't it? The freeze response, and then there's a flight response there as well. So moving forward, though, uh, uh, there it is. That should look familiar. If the social engagement system is not online, Brad had used this, of course, as we know, this is what people are, are hearing from us as providers, OK? If they're in sympathetic arousal, there's a good bet that their engagement system is not online, OK? So blah, 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 Ginger. I've been with patients who really are like the cats, right? The, the, the kitty cat who is, there I am again. You poor people. Um, what they hear. Wow. OK. What they hear is nothing. Now I'm off again. <laughs> it's poetry. It's all planned, folks. It's all planned. Um, so I feel like I'm hunching my shoulders. I'm getting very tense and traumatic. This is how I was in the restroom with the Kenny G playing. I was just sort of standing like this. It was very painful. No offense to any Kenny G fans. The Benson's a wonderful staff, though. So I mean that. So, <laughs> so the social engagement, creating conditions. I'm, I'm going to call this getting the ventral vagal system online, right? So in, with this patient population, how do we engage with this? Because that's where we can start to have that relationship and have some rapport. It down-regulates sympathetic arousal, but it's got to be based on the relationship, which was pointed out so beautifully by our expert around these issues, right? Thank you for everything you shared. So relationship is key. Now, people mentioned the 20 minutes that you have to work with people. Yeah, that's, that's a dilemma. So I, I want to ask these questions. How does this impact how we interact with our patients? Right? How do we start our sessions and appointments? I mean, are we having conversations like this? Or are we able to be open? Right, or that great video that we got to queue up was a wonderful example of maybe what not to do. What is the content <laughs> of our patient discussions? Okay, what are we talking about? What is our tone of voice? What is our body language? What is their tone of voice? What is their body language? I mentioned that startle response. What are you seeing? Okay. How do we roll with resistance? Okay, that's a very important thing. Motivational interviewing, we've heard of that. And then I, I really want to put some emphasis on this question. What are their interests? Because that's relationship building. You know, we can get so used to focusing on the problem and fixing the problem. You know, beginning therapists are notorious for this. I got to fix the problem. I got to do something. Well, no, we need to form a relationship, right? And that's based around interests and ideas. And here's the thing. When it, when it comes to getting the social engagement system online and working with the body, that's part of resourcing and trauma work. And this is where you all can contribute to that. OK, because if things are starting to get really escalated in the session and you know that somebody really loves riding their bike or they really love music, just divert into that content. I do it all the time. OK, have you been listening to the Moody Blues lately? I know you love the Moody Blues. Oh, yes, I love the Moody Blues. And they brighten. Their nervous system is making a shift there. So it's not just idle chit chat. 
Okay, this is, this is important content. So the more you know, the better you have uh, to have a tool at your disposal. Okay, does that make sense? I know time can be a, an issue, but I, I mean, I worked with a, a young man who was a child soldier in Africa. I mean, he killed people as a child. And um, we were in a session once and, and there was homicidal ideation and suicidal ideation. And I knew he, he loved singing. And you know what? That's what we talked about for about 20 minutes. Have you been to karaoke? How's that going? Any new musicians that you're enjoying? And you know, I was able to really kind of close that up, do my due diligence around self-harm or harm to others. And that session ended and he was in a better place. I wasn't doing therapy, but I had a lot of intention around that conversation, okay? What is, I'd mentioned that body language, what are the surroundings of the space where you're meeting with people? Okay, because they're hypervigilant. They might be looking around. You know, I know people can be time constrained, but a question around chronic pain, I have a friend who does private practice with chronic pain people, gets a lot of referrals from docs, does trauma work. What was going on in your life when the pain started? You know, what was happening? And that can give you a little more insight. That could open the floodgates, okay? so. I'm sure many of you do this great, but how do we, you know, when things just keep going and they want to say more and more and more and more and more? I think this is important. Validate, but, and kind of get the session back in the groove. Many patients report that they don't feel like their docs believe them. Okay, it's, it's worth knowing. And then the last piece here is I want to say it's okay to slow down. Slow things down. Brad mentioned this, you know, maybe it takes 10 appointments to get where we need to go, okay? And, and I tell my clinicians this all the time with complex cases, just slow it down. Have them come back and see you, all right? A uh, brief mention of syndromes that could indicate some sympathetic and parasympathetic mediated dynamics, trauma, things like migraines, fibromyalgia, autoimmune disorders, pain syndromes, IBS, chronic fatigue. Some of this has been talked about already. But we really want to rule this out and, and really makes the case for the theme that's been throughout this day is integrated care, right? And we're all in this together, right? Which is why a day like this can be so important in hearing these different disciplines and how we approach these folks. I need to mention some other modalities here. Um, exposure therapy, does anybody remember this Far Side cartoon? Professor Gallagher and his controversial technique of simultaneously confronting the fear of heights, snakes, in the dark. Good stuff. There's a padlock on the outside of the door, and I love the flat affect of the professor. Hmm, what's going on down there? So um, <laughs> we want to have a gradual exposure to stimulus if we're going this route. Imaginal exposure therapy is where you have people tell their story, story, and over again. Not a fan. We can talk about it afterwards if you don't agree, but I need to mention it. EMDR, I'm sure many of us have heard, heard of the EMDR. It's an extensive approach, and you can read about it on your own, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, working with the different hemispheres of the brain as well as content in the session. There's CBT that's been mentioned many times today with a trauma focus, thought patterns that are negative and working on beliefs in that regard. Dialectical behavioral therapy, have people heard of DBT? Okay, so this is a, a really great tool for people with trauma. There's four branches, distress tolerance, emotional regulation, mindfulness, and interpersonal effectiveness. So think about that social engagement piece. People learning how to develop those skills to be in relationship, okay? A couple of links, a uh, handful of links for your information. If you want to read more about some of this on your own, there's Psychology Today. This is a great way, great way to find a local therapist. Okay, you can search by region and also the uh, uh, techniques and the issues that they treat. Highly recommend psychology today. Traumahealing.org can help you find a somatic experiencing therapist. Also, you can go there and explore the data on that website. EMDRIA.org, EMDR, and then findcbt.org. And these are, th all these, of course, are in the slide deck that's available to you uh, regarding this presentation. And then, of course, there's the ACE study that was mentioned, cdc.gov, violence prevention. A study, some really great information on there as well. Some book recommendations, I like Peter Levine's book, In an Unspoken Voice, How the Body Releases Trauma and Restores Goodness. 
Uh, Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score, Brain, Mind, and Body in the Healing of Trauma, and then The Body Bears the Burden, all somatic-based books, okay? There's a ton out there. These are good starting points. How are we doing on time? We good? Great. We're going to shift gears now to Nora Stern. Thank you. I'll be back up. We're going to discuss the case together, okay? So I'm going to um, get a chance to talk about, oh wait, what did I just do? Oh, uh-oh, back up, desert. Um, I'm going to get a chance to talk about some of the work we've been doing at Providence around understanding pain better for clinicians and for patients and how we've been spreading that within rehab, primary care, and medical home. Um, we started this work, I started this work, um, I'm a physical therapist by training, and started to understand the neurophysiology of pain and was able to work with our rehab department. We have quite a few of our rehab therapists here. Um, uh, in training all the therapists in the state, in Providence, in a new understanding of pain, and then was able to partner with Providence Medical Group, and we have some of the leaders and members of the medical homes from here from there too, uh, who were working towards having a way to say yes to some new ways of approaching pain as they were beginning to rethink opiate prescribing. So it's been a wonderful partnership. Um, and it's all based on some great evidence about uh, how the way that we think about and talk about pain and how our patients understand pain actually changes their pain experience. So I'll get a chance to talk about that as much as possible in this short amount of time, just as a little bit of a disclosure. Um, there's been an interest in this, um, these pain education tools that we've developed, and we are in the process of packaging them. Oops. Um, so to take the case that um, Anderson had presented and talk about a little bit more um, about her story, and um, this is kind of adding on. She's had low back pain for about 10 years, and in the last three years, it's spread into the hips and into the upper back. And she actually says that it's sometimes hard to tell where she's experiencing it. She also has headaches, neck, and shoulder pain. And in fact, her entire body diagram is black, and we have we use body diagram. So if it's, if, if it's all black, that's a clue, central sensitization. Um, and in the second session, you learn that she also has chronic pelvic pain. She didn't divulge that at first. We know that she's not working, and we also know that she also says that she feels like she needs to do more around the house. She tries to, she ends up um, in bed watching TV because she's so painful, so a real boom or bust kind of cycle. And she's afraid of making her pain worse, so she does as little as possible. And her x-rays are multiple and show moderate degeneration to the spine. So I'll try to refer back to this person to kind of give a real person to the, um, the story. So focusing in on her pelvic pain, this, the theme of this um, conference is about trauma, and she has had a, an extensive trauma history. And, and by way of talking about how context and meaning change the pain experience, I'd like to compare the, kind, the tissue damage that might be associated with vaginal childbirth delivery as opposed to sexual violence. In both cases, you're probably going to have a fairly significant amount of tissue damage. In the case of childbirth, a, a woman is usually anticipating the, the whole event, the, end, the result of the event, with most of the time with great joy. They, they're expecting the pain. They know it's going to happen. There's logic to it, and they know there's going to be an end, and there's going to be a result that they're looking forward to. And in the months that follow, if there's no susceptive input coming from healing tissues, it gets up to the brain, and the brain processes it, makes sense of it, and says, how threatening is this really? It's actually not that threatening. I've got something much more important I'm focusing on. Tragically, in the case of sexual violence, it's, of course, not wanted at all. It's incredibly traumatic. The person's life is turned upside down. And as they continue to get no susceptible input from potentially healing tissues and inflammatory responses, as the tissues are normally healing, that information gets up to the brain. And the brain has to process it and make sense of it and say, how dangerous is this really? Well, it's associated with tremendous threat. In fact, her life might fall apart. So the threat value in the second context is going to be much greater. And it's, you can start to see how it would make sense that there's a tremendous statistical significance between sexual violence and chronic pelvic pain, whereas there isn't with vaginal childbirth delivery. 
So this is a wonderful model that really started a lot of this understanding of pain in a new way, which is from Louis Gifford, who's a British um, physiotherapist who died uh, about a year ago. And it, it's very elegant. It basically says that the input from the tissue is going to be one piece of the puzzle. In the case of trauma and childbirth, it may be roughly the same amount of tissue input. But the, whoa, it's very sensitive. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the processing is where things are going to change. And that's not to say, I, don't, I would like to emphasize that central sensitization is not only an emotional experience. There are other pieces to this puzzle, right? There's changes in the sensory cortex, for example, in the way that you, if you brace and guard and use your body um, in a way that um, limits the ability to have healthy movement, your sensory cortex will actually remodel as well and you'll have less of a good representation for that. And um, I can't go into tremendous detail right now, but I, I, want to, I don't want people to leave here thinking that chronic pain is always an emotional it is all emotional, right? There's a lot of pieces to the way that the brain continues to produce more threat. But all the, there's as many as 400 parts of the brain that might weigh in and determine how significant that information is. David Butler talks about it being like an orchestra. So there may be input from the inner ear that's associated with every time I bend forward, I have back pain. So eventually, even sloshing the inner ear can begin to activate that pain neural matrix and fire the pain response, as one example. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when I get into return to activity. So this is a helpful um, way to talk about pain with your patients, actually, too. That idea that, um, because I think it helps put the input part into context. So how we think about pain has a huge impact on the pain that we experience and how, how we, what we say matters in what patients understand. So talking about pain changes beliefs. Changing beliefs changes the threat value. And changing the threat value can change the pain experience. So I think that um, it's not enough for us to just kind of keep it in our heads that we think that pain is biopsychosocial, but actually to get used to spitting out of our mouths some ways of talking about pain differently than maybe we have in the past. And I'll give you some examples of that. So, this shift in thinking that we've been talking about, this is some work from David Butler and Laura Mosley, who wrote the tremendously wonderful book, Explain Pain, and uh, teach courses and seminars and have fabulous YouTube videos, and I worship them. Um, uh, boy, this is touchy. Uh, so some of the concepts that I think are really useful are pain is an output of the brain and the nervous system all the time for everyone, which means that all pain is real pain which gets away from that idea that somebody might, uh, what, that, that feeling that you have to do the detective work to decide whether a person has real pain or not. Now the detective work is, well, your pain is real. Let's work together on figuring out which parts of the pain experience are your story so that we can develop a care plan together, not are you having real pain or not, which I think is a, a trap that we were in several years back. Um, we don't need to have that conversation anymore. And I think that our patients have gotten that message. They've gotten the message that if they don't have a significant and obvious nociceptive driver to explain their pain experience, that their pain experience is not real. So it's very important to validate that, to say, I know that your pain is real. And the fact that the x-ray may or may not explain that has no impact on whether it's real or not. But let's together figure out what it is that might be running the show. Because your brain and nervous system have gotten a little too good at protecting you. So let's figure out together which parts of that process have been going on. Because no susception is neither, not a tissue injury, tissue damage is neither necessary nor sufficient for pain. And if there's one theme I want to leave you with, it's that pain and harm are not the same thing. This is a very important um, and elegant way to convey this idea of central sensitization to the people that you work with, to your patients. You can have pain without harm or tissue damage. And you can have tissue damage without pain. So making sure you're awake, wake up your brains. God, it, it wants to take a nap. I'm putting it down. Um, so think for a moment about a circumstance where you could have pain without tissue damage that you might have experienced or you know of in your patients. What can you think of? Pain without tissue damage. Migraine. A migraine, right? A headache in general, yeah. 
you're having you have something going on neurophysiologically, but it's not tissue damage. Yeah. What else? Fibromyalgia is a great one. Pain all over the body, but they didn't actually have tissue damage, injury all over the body, and that's a that's a great one for people to understand. What there was another one? I said grief. Grief felt physically. I don't know. I mean, you can't separate them, right? People say, I mean, it hurts. Yeah, right, right. And pain and suffering are actually linked in the International Association for the Study of Pain for that reason. And then the poster child for this, pain is not equivalent to harm, is the one that Thomas had mentioned, phantom limb pain, where you actually no longer have tissue there. But the pain has a very real representation in the brain, in the sensory cortex, because of changes in the sensory cortex, and is producing a pain response because of an ongoing threat value. Not exclusively emotional, definitely very real. And then you can have harm without pain, like the battlefield injuries that you hear about where people do incredibly heroic things, and they're probably truly heroic, but they also are responding to a threat value around them, their survival, the survival of their buddies that is much greater even than the traumatic injury that they experienced. A more simple example than that might be um, if I'm walking along and I step off the curb and sprain my ankle. In normal circumstances, that danger message would get up to my brain right away, and my brain would appropriately evaluate the threat value of that extra stretch response and the nociceptive fibers having been activated, and I would appropriately respond and do the things I need to protect myself because that is an actual um, appropriately threatening circumstance. But if I step off the curb to sprain my ankle, and the reason I stepped off the curb is because I'm trying to get my kid out of the street and there's a bus coming, I may not even feel my ankle until my kid is safe and I'm safe because the threat of the bus is far greater than the threat of my ankle. Until I'm safe and then I'll feel appropriate pain and I should, right? People, uh, physicians report this in the emergency department too, that people are sort of not experiencing pain until their nervous system is able to kind of quiet down a little. So pain and harm are not the same thing. Very helpful concept to share. So how are we maybe inadvertently creating a sense of danger in our patients, or our patients are creating a sense of danger that we may not even be aware of, that we might be able to make some modifications in? Whoops. Um, how we talk about MRI and x ray cells, even choosing whether we have a person get MRI and X-ray results, because we know that if you're over the age of 20, you're probably gonna have some degeneration, right? So we might respond to an X-ray and say, ooh, you have moderate degeneration in your spine, you just have severe degeneration in your spine. But as Thomas had pointed out, in, in some studies, 20 to 60, 50% of people with moderate to severe degeneration don't report pain. So the, so the X-ray itself is not, it's not going to necessarily explain your pain. But, but if we set people up by, uh, with, the way, with talking about it as though it is equivalent to the amount of pain that they're experiencing, we're setting them up for an experience of danger. Fear of movement. The idea that pain and harm go together, people will begin to do less and less because they feel pain when they're doing an activity. And physical therapists, uh, occupational therapists have been guilty of this for a long time, and hopefully we're changing it. Oh, that exercise hurt. Well, then don't do that. It hurts you to get the, to empty the dishwasher, then don't do that. And I'm not saying you should just tell your patients to go out and do everything that hurts. I'll talk in a moment about how to slowly reintroduce activity and kind of fly below the radar of the protect by pain response. But being able to reframe the message and the way that we respond to that fear is important. What happens also here is that, um, I swear to God, you see I'm not touching it, right? <laughs> Stay. Um, the other thing that's happening with this person is that their sensory cortex has become very disorganized. It's become what we call smudged and blurred. And this person, you remember our patient, has pain that's begun to spread. It's vaguely located. It's hard to tell exactly where it is. And that's a classic sign of what we call sensory cortical smudging, or disorganization of the sensory cortex. Now you can go. Um, just the struggles that people have in living with pain, as Anderson was just talking about, has come up again and again. Somebody who um, has been having struggles associated with fear, anxiety, trauma, depression, that person's emergency response system is more activated. They're more likely to perceive threat. And being able to simply validate that can begin to help decrease the threat and sense of danger. 
And then what we say about medications, which has come up several times over the course of today. If the message, if the patient believes medication is the only thing that can help me, and then you're having a conversation about tapers, recognize that that could be an incredibly threatening conversation to have, as has been brought up. That alone could be producing more danger. So now the brain is very interested in the threat value of anything coming up the pike from the nociceptive, from nociceptive input. So how we talk about pain really can change how people experience it. I'm going to show you, and um, this is probably not the best resolution, but um, yeah, you're not seeing the image too well. But this is a fMRI study that was done by Laura Mosley, a great researcher on pain neuroscience. And um, this woman is in a physical therapy clinic with an fMRI, because we all have those in our clinics, right? Um, and she's doing an abdominal stabilizing exercise. So she's not moving her back. But and what, you can't, what isn't resolving too well is that there's quite a bit of red quite a bit of activity in what we would call the pain neuro matrix. So her brain, even though she's not moving her back, her brain is pretty interested in the threat value of what's going on. She's probably experiencing pain. That same day, she goes through a pain education class. So no tissue healing happened. It's just a couple of hours, right? And then she goes back in the fMRI, she does the same abdominal stabilizing exercise. And I don't know if you'll be able to appreciate this, but there's a quiet, so that the, the, that brain is much more quiet now. So what you're seeing here is the quieting of central sensitization, the decrease in threat value, or really the difference between pain and harm, right? She's not, it's not like she's cured of persistent pain, but her brain now has a, a different experience to associate with the meaning of input coming from the periphery. Oh, I'm feeling some discomfort. I'm sore, but I'm safe. Another study that was done similar to this by Adrian Liu looked at forward bend and uh, measured forward bend before pain education and after. Before pain education, the woman had about five degrees forward bend. Afterwards, touched the floor. So the difference there wasn't that she couldn't touch the floor beforehand, but if I narrate her brain, it might go something like, oh, I can't do that. I have pain. So all those different neural functions associated with bending over, inner ear sloshing, visual input, paraspinal muscle stretching, weight shifting over her feet, etc., become coupled with, enslaved in producing the pain response. The second time, she gets to five degrees and says, oh, that's just pain. I'm sore, but I'm safe. That's the beginning of resilience. Okay. Um, see, I didn't touch it. It's just fatigued. <laughs> and it's asleep. It's, yeah, okay. Um, well, now I'll be talking about this. Uh, so, <laughs> talking about some ideas about phrasing. The difference between creating danger and creating safety. I'm worried about my x-rays. Danger message might be, ooh, your x-rays look pretty bad. If I had x-rays like that, I would be able to walk. Um, safety message might be something like, you know, half of the people who have de joint degeneration actually have no pain. I can't do blank. It's too painful. Well, then you'd better avoid doing that then. Or safety message, you know, your system has gotten a little too good at protecting you, but that doesn't actually mean that it's causing you harm. And I'm going to talk a little bit further about return to activity in a moment. Medication is the only thing that, that can help me. I have to stop your medication. There's nothing else I can do. Could be something that provokes more of a sense of danger. Or we now understand pain a bit differently. It turns out there's a lot we can do to produce, uh, that the brain does to produce pain, and there's a lot of opportunity for us to create change. That's been talked about in several ways. So how can we create more safety and hope? Understanding pain, changing the, the, the context for looking at return to activity, how we respond to an x-ray or a test or the a request for that, and then thinking about prioritizing somebody actually getting back to some of the things in their life that give them pleasure and joy, rather than putting that off until they are not having any pain, which is very common. So to talk a little bit about what we've been doing in rehab, and I'd like to say that I, we've been kind of approaching this, all of this pain work in Providence and trying to do kind of a decentralized integrated pain care between the work of primary, primary care medical home within um, uh, the primary care physicians work and behavioral health and then the work in rehab. We focused on pain education, especially with classes, videos, and written material and how we talk about pain. 
Um, we work with physiological quieting and we have um, the, our mindfulness videos av available for home use and then pacing and grid exposure. So I'll just talk about each of those a little bit. Um, we try to make our pain education very easily accessible to everybody. They can be referred into pain education or watch the videos in the patient rooms. They can watch our videos in, in rehab and in primary care. They can be referred into our classes from rehab, primary care, from behavioral health, et cetera. They can be referred from the emergency department. Um, and these two kind of complement each other. So it's been, it, it's been very helpful for helping clinicians start the conversation but not feel like they have to have a PhD in neuroscience. It's kind of like, let's start to begin to change the phrasing a little bit. And it might go something like, um, you know, I, I can appreciate that this has been a really long process for you. I want you to know that I know your pain is real. I don't completely understand all the different pieces of the puzzle. Your pain is quite complex because everyone's pain is complex and you've been living with this for a long time. So what I'd like to ask you to do is go to this class and I need for you to come back and tell me what parts of it sound like your story. Because those are the parts, the, then we can build a plan of care together. So that's asking for their alliance, telling them that you need to get their engagement um, and, and investment, but also that you don't really understand all of their complexity. Um, we do some basic physiological quieting um, in rehab, and I'm, I'll talk a minute about when that's good to do and when that's not good to do. Um, and then I want to talk just a moment about a return to activity idea. And this comes from um, Mosley and Butler's work. So if this gal says, um, you know, she's sitting on the sofa a lot, um, not able, feeling like she can do very much, but she would really like to get back to taking her dog for a walk. So I might have a conversation with her because we want to be able to, by the way, if we think back to the functional MRI, something that I didn't, wasn't, um, didn't point out was that one aspect of her fMRI that did not change was the sensory cortex because she needs to experience her body differently. She needs to move. She needs to live in her body in a different way. So we have to get her moving. So back a long time ago, when things weren't quite so hard, she might have been able to do a tremendous amount of things before she had a protect by pain response and before she had tissue damage. So the protect by pain response would be a warning sign to not keep going or she'd have tissue damage. Below that radar, she could take the dog for a walk, go to the kid's soccer game, clean the house, do all kinds of things without pain and without tissue damage. Then her system became much more sensitized. In a sensitized system, she's been deconditioned for a long time, so she doesn't have the same level of tissue resilience that she did, but it's still pretty high. Let's say it's up maybe here. So we're going to say this is the new level at which she might have tissue damage. But the protect by pain response level is very low, right? Anything she does produces pain. So what's helpful to, to recognize is, Casey, we'll call her, when you do all those things, it's causing you a lot of pain. But realize it's actually still not causing you any tissue damage. It's not causing you harm. So that's helpful to know. But I don't want you to be doing all the things that cause you lots of pain because that's going to continue to activate an already sensitized system. So what we want to do is fly below the radar of the protect by pain response level so that we can slowly get your system more resilient. So that might be something like, can you walk for five minutes? Can't do that. Can you walk to mailbox? Can't do that. Can you get up once an hour and walk to the other end of the room and back? Well, yeah. Okay, that's where we're going to start. Every hour you're going to get up and walk to the other end of the room and back. You're going to do that every day for a week. You're not going to do it twice an hour. You're going to do it once an hour. If you have a flare-up, remember, you're sore, but you're safe. You're going to learn from it. Did I not sleep all the night before? I have a fight with my spouse, etc. But you keep going. And then the next week you go twice an hour. And then eventually you go down to the end of the block, but you slowly increase activity so that you're not getting into that boom or bust cycle. And there had been a question about ultra marathoners. And this works for people who need to be kind of scaled back as well as people who need to be amped up. So that's an idea about pacing. And, there's a, and then if we think about, there's a slightly different way of thinking about that, which is I talked about those um, 400 different parts of the brain that could be coupled with and enslaved in producing the pain response they can be used as well. So if somebody says, 
Every time I bend over, I have back pain. In fact, when I think about bending over, I have back pain. In fact, I always have back pain when I bend over at work, and when I'm at work, I always have back pain. So all those different functions, thinking about work, inner ear sloshing, premotor cortex, planning on bending forward, all of those things have become coupled with the pain response. So those functions can become decoupled from the pain response and coupled with more pleasurable activities like sitting in a chair and nodding your head up and down while you watch your grandkid play with the ball or let, lying on your back and letting your knees drop side to side while you breathe easily and gently. So an ideal rehab experience of someone with a trauma history might be about especially decreasing threat, less on information and more on experience, including pacing on a very non-threatening activity. Might include physiological quieting, and it would include communication with behavioral health and primary care. And I think also considering the timing of when you might use behavioral health and when you might use rehab. So for example, in some cases, and I think we need, we've been talking about having a good, elegant way of knowing what the workflow is for when somebody goes to rehab versus primary care first. We've been using the patient activation measure for motivation, but that doesn't get to some of these other aspects of trauma. So in a person who's less complex, we would go ahead and do physiological quieting. With somebody more complex, that's probably where we're starting to feel like we need some, primary, some uh, behavioral health support. Um, so considering motivation is helpful. Having the same language for talking about pain is really important, I think. Um, getting the same aligning the messages. Um, and then I would also say, if your primary care doc or anybody who is developing a care plan, when you develop a care plan, strongly endorse it, prescribe those things, because you're taking them at least as seriously as you would a medication. And then ask about them when they come back. I asked you to do some relaxation work last time I saw you. How's that been going? And, and then if there's a barrier, work that out together. If you don't ask about it, they're going to assume you didn't think it was that important. So um, I think that that can make a huge difference. Um, so what we're going to do now is um, uh, we're going to review the case again. Anderson and I are both going to talk together. And I'm going to, um, we're going to talk about some things about this case. What I'd like to do is we're going to just look through it. And I'm going to ask you to look at it in terms of um, strengths, concerns and patient goals. So we have this person who has, oh, wait, um, a history of physical and sexual abuse, multiple foster homes, she's in recovery, she has this increased startle response um, and the other things going with on with sympathetic and, and parasympathetic tone. She's got back pain with this um, sensory cortical spreading. Uh, she has, uh, and, and the whole body diagram is black. She's not working and she's got this boom or bust cycle, afraid of making her pain worse, and moderate degeneration in her spine. So what else would you like to know about this person? Maybe some things about what her goals are, what she likes. So we're gonna add some things here. She used to ride her bike, but she's afraid of doing so because of pain. She wants to be able to turn, return to walking her dog in the woods. Her spouse is supportive of the work that she's doing. She does have pain with sex and she avoids sex. And she has a close group of friends and a supportive recovery community. So I'm going to just come over here and um, remind you that we're talking about, so what are some of her strengths that you heard about? Just shout them out. Sober. Huh? Sober for a year. Sober? Mm-hmm. Support. Support. Uh huh. Spouse. She wants to walk. She wants to walk her dog. She has a of being active. Uh huh. What about um, concerns? Fear avoidance. History of trauma. I know you can't read my writing. Maybe beliefs. Mm -hmm. What about her goals? Her 
And she's kind of specific about it too. And, and, and it's with her dog, which is kind of cool because then there's that sort of positive reinforcement with the dog. Yeah. Probably wants to stay sober. She's motivated about that, it sounds like. Yay. <laughs> she, she wants to take care of her life, right? Okay, great. So um, what I, we thought we would do is that we would each sort of tag team and bounce off of each other and feel free to chime in um, and talk about how things that we might focus on with this person based on this profile. And, and I lay this out because this is kind of like the multidisciplinary the case reviews that we've been doing um, with Providence Medical Group and that we do in rehab um, is to kind of lay things out a little bit like this, not, not exactly this, but I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you now, Anderson. Mm -hmm. There I am. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? So um, just a couple points around this. I know we're getting sh short on time. What's that? Okay. Um, the strengths really speaks to what I was saying about resourcing. This is a way to help somebody resource. So here, with this case, I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. When the, this patient came to see me, very weary, very mistrusting, I worked on a rela therapeutic relationship with this person for a month, okay? She even told me, I don't like the sound of your voice. She actually <laughs> told me that. So, um, so I spent a lot of time talking about her interests and getting her oriented at the beginning of the session. Usually the first 10 or 15 minutes were spent, how are you? Have you been getting outside at all? Have you been spending time with your partner? And then from a somatic perspective, as we're discussing this content and this resiliency, she was tracking those sensations, okay? So we don't start with all the heavy stuff. It's about, oh, I want you to just feel that goodness. I want you to feel that pleasure. I want you to stay with that. That coupled with making sure that she was oriented to the environment. That's where we began. Okay? And we did that for a long time. And the trauma and all the intensity would arise on its own. Okay? But what that resourcing allows me to do with this patient is, is it's almost like putting gas in her nervous system. She's got a full, she, her tank is more full so that when these protective traumatic responses come up, we've laid some groundwork there. And you can start to get into that regulatory pattern, okay? Um, and uh, what that makes me think of too is that that approach is, is actually creating a sense of safety also around your pain experiences. And I would, I would make, make that transparent in a way that isn't too kind of overwhelming but to point out that she's actually quieting her nervous system as she's doing, talking about the things that make her feel better and doing the things that make her feel better. And that decreases the brain's interest in producing the pain experience and might use that as an in-room for starting to do some physiological quieting work. And then, um, so I'd be interested in um, giving a lot of positive reinforcement for what she's got and using her goal around walking the dog to slowly reintroduce pacing, which I already talked about a little bit. Um, and uh, maybe do some physiological quieting, but I might want to check in with her awesome behavioral health person and see if there's a better time to do that. Um, and then um, using pain education as it comes up so that I'm not over, with some people we might actually have them go to a pain education class. In her case, given how overwhelmed she is, I probably would need it out a little bit more in the course of helping her get back to activity. And I'm especially interested, another concern I might have is that she has that black body diagram, so she's got what I would call sensory cortical smudging, at least in part. And so I'd be interested in working with both, helping her get back to some activity, so she generally becomes more resilient, and I would also be interested in, in getting her doing some things that help um, retrain her sensory cortex so, in, so that I might, for example, give her some simple exercise routines that tune into the whole body. Tai Chi-like things or yoga type things or asking her to, to notice the tips of her fingers as she reaches out to the side and feel that her feet on the ground and feel her rib cage expand so that you're starting to retrain the sensory cortex. Um, in a way that helps to refine its representation. You can also do this through body scan, 
um, uh, physiological quieting work, uh, mindfulness work. So those are probably some of the main things that I would focus on. And I'd probably want to keep it very simple, emphasize that she is at the beginning of a process, and that we will consider it successful that we have begun a process, and give lots of positive reinforcement at each step, and see her intermittently, so that I can see her over a long period of time, and maybe through a flare-up, but not expect that the goal is for her pain to go away, but to get to a little step of functional improvement, and emphasize the importance of that, and that that is exactly with that pacing idea, that that's how we're going to desensitize her system. And just to, 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 to just to uh, wrap up where I went with this patient was, after all that resourcing, uh, this was a person who wanted to return to work in a few weeks, but whose startle response was so strong that someone even walking behind her in public would induce panic. And she said to me, I, I don't know how I'm going to function in my life. And so I, I knew that's where we were headed. And it wasn't content driven, but eventually we got to a place where she could somatically start to experience some of the sensations around not feeling safe with her back. And they were intense sessions, I can assure you. There was a lot of uh, panic and anxiety and um, nausea. It was all, I mean, you know, trauma affects, our body responds to traumatic events. So working with the whole body needs to be there. But, but we, de we developed a really good relationship. And just this week, I'm happy to report, um, she uh, has reported a major decrease in symptoms and actually has hope. And it, it's, it's really great to be able to work with people in a way that, that takes into account the whole system. And um, she's been amazing. And it's, it's, it's great to see the progress for this particular individual. Are we good for questions good now? For questions? Yeah. We're open to questions. Yeah, so the question was about prevention, and I think that this is a, a great question. Um, I think that as we start to talk about pain differently, um, we are actually preventing persistent pain by helping to change people's misunderstandings about the relationship between pain and harm so that they're not making that turn into chronicity. Um, one of the, what Rebecca's referring to is we did a pilot um, at St. Vincent that I'm hoping will spread where we put our pain education and relaxation videos up on patient TV monitors on one of the units um, at St. Vincent Hospital. And now they're up all over St. Vincent. Uh, and so the next step is to fully socialize that and train nursing and um, using it. Rehab, we now have inpatient rehab specialists in persistent pain. Um, who can who can address that? So uh, it's a it's a non pharmacological intervention. Uh, in in the case of somebody who's really down the path of chronicity, inpatient probably isn't quite the place for that sort of delivery of service. But if they just had acute pain and they just had say a, a knee surgery, it's awesome. It's like we're going to help reframe your understanding of what's normal and what to expect as you get better. Yeah.